chapter 13, and we're going to read this tonight and um, spend some time in it. While you're turning there, um, maybe Matt, you can put the uh, second slide up, and I'll kind of preface this a little bit. Um, this is going to look a little strange to you, but this is um, this is a frog made out of cloth that is in the process of being dissected. Now. I thought about putting a real picture of a frog being dissected up there, but I thought that might, for those of you that are a little squeamish, that might be a little much uh, to put a partially dissected frog up. Um, here's why I put that up there. Way, I, when I was in Bible college, oh, this is going on 20 years now, um, we were studying, I was in a theology class, and the professor said, you know, sometimes when you study theology, it's a little bit like dissecting a frog. You can learn a lot as you go, but you kind of destroy the thing as you're going through it all, right? And and I that came to mind this week because here we are studying what probably ranks in the top five or ten of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture, right? This is First Corinthians 13 about love, and we're gonna we're gonna kind of dissect it a little bit here tonight. And I got a little worried that as we do that, you sort of pull it all apart and then you lose the sense of beauty of it all. And I I don't want to do that, but on the other hand, I do want to spend a little time kind of digging into the into the details of it. So um, so anyways, there's there's a little preface for us. Um, we're going to read um, in three parts, and I'll need uh, maybe three volunteers who'd be willing to read for us. The first person to read um, from, really from, yeah, from, from verse 1 through 3, and then 4 through, um, 4 through 8, and then... Uh, nine through the remainder of the passage. I think I broke that up right. My page has all kinds of markings on it, so I can't always see where I broke it up. But I think that works. One through three, four through, um, no, four through seven, four through seven, and then eight through um, eight through the remainder of the text. So who's, who'd like to volunteer? Three people. I've got Bruce, Margie. Uh, so Bruce, you start off with one through three. Margie, you do four through seven. Who wants to read eight through um, through thirteen? Who'd be willing to do that? All right, then I saw two people, so I'll have David do it, and then I'll catch you next time, Jim. So Bruce first, then Margie, and then David. Go ahead and uh, let's read this together. All right, so we're going to do what we um, what we do, and Matt, if you go to the next slide, um, I'm going to give you about five minutes. Look through the text, and here are the, the questions that I want you to focus on tonight. As always, you can look for the words that are repeated, because that's always a good clue to the, uh, the focus and the emphasis of the text. But also, I want you to just remember the context, um, and if it helps, go back to chapter 12 and skim through that. Um, if you have a good memory, you remember what the, some of the problems are in the Corinthian church. But remember those things, and then ask yourself the question, how does that shape your understanding 
of what 1 Corinthians 13 is about, because I think that nuances this a little bit. And then um, identify the subparts to the text. So how would you divide it up? I already gave you a pretty major clue in how I had you read that. But go back and look at what are some, of, if you remember the three people that read, what are the themes of each of those sections? Um, and how does the, the logic kind of flow? And then, as I said, you can look for those repeated words. So go ahead. I'll give you about five minutes to do that and um, just see what you come up with. And then we'll get into some discussion about this. One or one more minute or so. All right, let's um, let's come back together and see if we can put some of the pieces together. Um, so first of all, the the context in Corinth. What what's the what's the problem that Paul is addressing um, in in the whole book, and how does that shape our understanding of First Corinthians thirteen? Anyone want to take a stab at that? That's right. That's right, the totem pole idea, right? If you speak in tongues, you're really near the top. You're like super Christian, and if you don't do that, you're kind of sub-Christian and maybe not really a genuine believer. So, And then there were other ways they did that too in terms of you know wealth and those kinds of things. So that was a big problem. Um, how does that 
influence how we look at a passage like 1 Corinthians 13? How, how will that nuance this a bit? Well, let's put it this way. If you didn't have that context, what might you tend to just, how, how might you interpret this passage on love? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you might use it, you know, just in weddings or just to talk to married couples and you might sort of use it for, you know, how should two Christians who are married, how should you love each other? Well, First Corinthians 13. Did anyone have this at their wedding, by the way, as their wedding text? Yeah, okay, at least one did. Yeah. I think, oh, just Darlene did. Well, that <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> um and I think it's a perfectly appropriate text for a wedding. Um, I, if I and I've used it for when I've married couples before, but um, I think you have to. I think you're going to look at it in terms of okay, what's the difference between the self-centered way of living and in the Corinthian case about spiritual gifts? Right, I'm near the top. I'm the super Christian versus near the bottom. And and then Paul's contrasting. What does love actually look like? It's not self-centered. It's other-centered. Right. So. It certainly applies at weddings, but I think you have to take it. In fact, let's go to the next slide real quick there, Matt. And um, just while we're on the topic, um, some of you will recognize the cartoon there at the far left, right? Those love is ones in the, they were always in the paper, and it says there, not sure how readable that is, love is not picking up the most expensive dish on the menu. Uh, I'll let you decide for yourself if that's true or not. Um, then in the middle, every time I look at the keyboard and I see that, I see that you and I are always together. And then uh, the last one, I think the top part got cut off. It says, love is not how many days, months, or years you've been together. Love is about how much you love each other, which is strange because I always thought you couldn't use the word you're defining in the definition. Um, but I put all of that up there because a lot of times um, in, in our culture, when, when we think about love, we make it into something very sentimental. Um, and I don't know, I suppose if you want to put that on a Valentine's card to your significant other, okay. Um, I won't stop you. But um, but my point is that we culturally we understand love more as a sentimental or an emotional experience. And Paul is really coming along and he's teaching us a whole different way of looking at um, and understanding what love is all about. Um, you can go back one slide now, Matt. Um, what about... So, so when, when we read the text, we read it in three different parts. And I'm wondering if any of you have any thoughts in terms of what these three kind of sub-paragraphs, if you will, what, what are the themes of each of them? Um, how, would you, how would you summarize that? Okay, what do you mean by that? Okay, right. That's right. You think you are. That's right. It's all about what you do, but you're doing it apart from, from the kind of love that Paul's about to explain. And so Paul's really saying all that kind of work that you're doing, you think you're doing so well, but if it doesn't have love, then it's all meaningless. Yeah, good. What about the second section there, which, as I had it, was um, verses 4 through verse 7. Um, what is that? That defines love. That's right. Yeah, and interestingly, so that's that's the definition because he says love is love is, but if you and if you can even go one kind of sub level below that, because Paul does uh, in verse four, he first does what love is, um, what it does, what it is not, what it is not, and then what it um, what it does not do. So you even can follow that. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not this. It is not this. It is not this. And it does not do this. And then it finishes up by saying. Love does all these things. So a little sub, even break it down a little more. But the point is it's a definition of love. The whole section here is where Paul finally tells us what love actually looks like. Um, what about the last section there? What is Paul getting at in verses uh, 8 through um, 13? What is that about? This one I think is a little harder to, to summarize, I, I think. Um, maybe you came up with something. Um, what, do you, what do you have? It's not over. Okay, what do you mean by that? Okay. 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 
So say a little more about how that relates to the idea of, of love, because I think you're on to, on, on to it here, but let's flesh that out even more. Um, what does it say about love? Okay, okay, work on it. Yeah, that's right. There's there's growth that needs to take place. Yeah, good. Um, and I'm going to add something to that in a little bit too because I think there's there's one other thing that I want to bring out, but that's good. Um, any other thoughts just on, on that structure? How about words that are repeated besides love? You can't take that one because that's an obvious one. But what else is repeated in this um, in this chapter that you think helps us understand the meaning? What are some of the words that Paul repeats throughout. Okay, oh, sure. yeah. Right, conditional sentences. If this, then that. If this, then that. Or if this, then not that. Um, that's right. Yeah, there are a few of those, um, especially there in that first section there. If I do this, but I don't have that, then this, right? So it's, they have even technical names, first class conditional sentences and all that. But the point is, it's an if-then construction. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, so a temporal um, idea, temporal conditional. When this, then this. Uh-huh. What else? Any any other words or grammar things that jump off the page at you? Yep. Right. Yep, that's right. Now I see, even then, as I, yep. Or now we see, now I know. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Yeah, right, right. Um, so where do you see that? Because I'm trying to... Yeah. Yeah, yep. Right. That's right. I'm glad you said it that way because in a minute I'm gonna we're gonna dig into that definition and we're gonna see that that's exactly what Paul does, and he kind of yeah he he gets at that. That's right. Anyone else? Right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And if you um, if you go back to the end of chapter 12, right, and we covered this last week where Paul talks about are all apostles, are all prophets, do all work miracles, do all possess, do all speak with tongues. So he kind of works his way down the list. And a lot of times the last thing on the list tends to be the least important. Um, and so Paul finishes that list by saying, do all speak in tongues and do all interpret, right? So he's kind of purposely leaving that to the last to remind them that, look, you're prizing these gifts of speaking in tongues above everything else, but um, you know what, it's way down the list, right? You've got apostles and teachers at the top only because they're the ones that communicate for everyone to hear. And then Paul says, then he begins to unpack the, the tongues. Okay, let's talk about tongues without, um, and knowledge and mystery um, and prophecies without love. So you're right, he's he's hitting them exactly where they were. It was their sensitive spot. They didn't. They didn't want to buy into the idea that tongues were somehow less important. They thought that tongues were everything. And Paul says, "No, you've missed the point on all of this." Right. Yeah. He says that at least twice in there. Yep. He doesn't say I'm a little less or it's not so good. He says nothing. Yeah. It's. It's a, it is literally an all or nothing thing. That's right. You either have love or it's nothing. Yeah, George. <laughs> we'll let you cheat. That's okay. Mm -hmm. That's right. Exactly right. So because you, th then we could say, well, I just don't have that gift. <laughs> and so I can be selfish and I can... So, so you're right, Paul, especially if you think of in Galatians, right? Love is, is the outworking of the Holy Spirit in us. And that's so important to remember because 
Um, in a minute, we're going to look at the standard that Paul sets. And when it comes to love, it's, it's pretty high, right? I mean, Paul is describing a way of living that, I don't know about you, but I look at this and say, oh, I have a long ways to go on this. And if it's all about how hard am I working at this, I'm going to set myself up for failure and discouragement and despair because I'll never make it. But because it's an outworking of the Holy Spirit, um, I can trust that God can bring this about in my life. So I'm glad you said that. That's a, that's a good point. Um, let's go, and I want to set up just a little contrast. We've touched on a couple of these things, but let's go to the next slide. Um, and, and we'll ask the question, what is the point? And by asking this, I'm, I'm setting up a contrast between how the Corinthians are looking at um, how the Corinthians' point of view and Paul's point of view. For the Corinthians, they valued the spiritual gifts, especially tongues and prophecies, as an end in themselves. Those were the ultimate goal for the Christian faith. And Paul is saying, no, it's not, that's not it. It's love that is more important and not the kind of mushy, sentimental kind of love of, you know, that we already talked about. Paul says, it's, it's the kind of love I'm about to show you. Now, here's the difference. Um, if gifts are the ultimate thing, then gifts are valued in and of themselves. They become status markers for believers. They become ways that you can set yourself up above other people. Um, but if love is the ultimate goal, then gifts are given so that you might use them for others. So your gifts are not given to advance yourself above up, up on that totem pole. The gifts that God gives are ways that you serve other people, and that completely changes a person's uh, perspective on gifts. Gifts then become about they become a way to um, to build up and strengthen um, the church. So Paul has a different thing in mind. He's trying to, to change the Corinthians' way of looking at this, uh, from from just focusing on the gifts to seeing what he calls the most excellent way, which is the way of love. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, what is love? And that was, I, I put that up then. That always reminds me of a song that was really popular back in the 90s and a sort of a tacky, corny little love song. But uh, we're not doing that tonight, not here. I'm not going to sing that for you. But here's where Paul, in verses uh, 4 through 7, um, he describes what love is, and I think implicit in all of this is, is sort of, um, it, you have to kind of look at it as a contrast. So when Paul says love is patient, the opposite of that is obviously impatience. And impatience says, you adapt to my timeline. You fit into my life. And if you don't, I get irritated and edgy with you. And patience says, well, your timeline first. How can I serve you and work around your schedule and your needs and your timeline? Um, unkindness is that sort of sev severity and that rigidness with other people. You're kind of cold and hard and unfeeling towards them. And kindness is about doing good things for other people to build them up and to encourage them and to show love for them. Um, envy and boasting is all about wanting good for yourself. And you actually bristle when someone else benefits somehow. When you see someone else succeeding and doing well, you're not happy for them, you're actually sort of annoyed at them and you even resent them for it. And on the other hand, um, not envying and not boasting is really about saying, if you're happy and if you're succeeding, then I'm happy for you, right? And that's, for some of us, that's a challenge, I think, right? You get annoyed when other people are doing well and Paul comes along and says, no, love is about rejoicing in what others are doing. Um, rude, when Paul talks about rude, Probably he has in mind some of the problems in the Corinthian church that we talked about way back in chapter 5 and 7 where um, Paul's, the, the sexual immorality that was going on. Um, and and Paul's, remember, Paul says that he uses the same word there that he does here. He says some of this is so shocking uh, that it's, you know, even outsiders won't touch this stuff that you guys are doing. And so Paul is using that word there probably to make that connection. He sees that the Christians are rude in, the, in their, not just that they have bad manners, but that they're actually really shocking in how they are um, conducting themselves. And um, love, on the other hand, is not rude. It shows restraint. It shows proper decorum, proper behavior for the setting that you're in. And then, um, yeah, so on the whole, what is it? Love is about, uh, the absence of love insists on your way. It's all about what I want, what do I need, my wants and desires come first and everybody else has to fit in and adapt to me. And the flip side of that is um, love is pleased to yield to the will of others. Um, 
any questions on that so far? There's a few more that we're going to just kind of touch on, but I'm going to give you a chance to respond to that first. It's one of the challenges when you come to a list in the Bible is like, how do you, how do you, you can spend probably 20 minutes on each item in the list, or you can try to sort of fly over the whole thing real quickly, but... Um, Yeah, I think so. I think that'd be a fair, right? Because if you have the totem pole, and even if you wouldn't say we're competing, you that mindset is there, right? Who's at the top, and how do I get to the top? And I'll get to the top if it means I have to step on you. That's just how the game is played. So I think that's a fair um, statement. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's go to the next slide then. Here's a, a few more kind of thoughts as Paul describes it. Love doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. It doesn't take pride in the sin and the fall of other people, um, right? That's a big deal because sometimes you, you see, um, you know, whether they be celebrities or whether they be just people in local news or people that you know personally, and there's, you know, maybe especially if they're people that you just don't really like, and then all of a sudden they stumble and fall really badly, and there's that part of you that, you know, you maybe would never admit that out loud, but there's that part of you that's kind of like, oh, I'm glad to see them fall, right? And Paul says, no, real love doesn't rejoice in evil in whatever form it shows up, right? There's, there's grief when sin has its way um, in, in this world. And love delights in what is true and what is righteous. Um, love is not short-fused. And here's where, again, Paul is focusing on the positive things. So the opposite is, um, the opposite of bearing all things is short-fused, right? You just, there's no cushion for inconveniences. You just sort of fly off the handle at the smallest provocation. Um, love believes all things, and a lack of love is just skeptical of everybody. You you doubt what they say. You don't believe in them maybe for who they are and what they can do. You just have this general um, sense of skepticism. And then related to that, hope, love hopes all things as opposed to lo um, a lack of it being cynical. There's just sort of a a general sense that nothing's ever going to work out and, um, you know, we're all going to die anyways, that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, uh, doesn't endure all things, it endures all things and it never ends, as opposed to when difficulty presents itself, love just kind of gives up on the person, right? Someone's challenging and love just, love sticks with it. Um, now, I think that doesn't mean you don't know how to set boundaries. I think you do. That's important. And that, But that's, those boundaries are for their for the person you're caring for as much as they are for yourself. Um, Paul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep, that's that's tough. Yeah, that's that's a really good question um, because, it, you know, it sounds so lofty to say, I don't want to be skeptical of anybody, I want to love you, but I think... I think, yeah, um, you know, each case is a little different. I think I think there's, there's often going to be a willingness to try to see the person rebuild trust, and but also being wise about that too, and saying, listen, you have to know there's a pattern here, and that pattern has destroyed some of the trust, and I want to trust you, but here's what I need to see happen to help me trust you better, um, and that that takes place in the context of relationship. I think sometimes if you don't, if there if there is no relationship, in other words, if it's just kind of someone that you casually know, you know, yeah, you might not be able to have that that trust in the person. Um, but you're right. I mean, it's it's this is not easy stuff. This is I think I think challenging um, for all of us. Um, I don't always know exactly the right answer and exactly what that looks like because each individual situation is different. But um, and that's why I said you know we need. You know, there have to be boundaries sometimes because you don't want to keep trusting someone if that means they're going to come back and hurt you again and again. At some point you have to say, you know, this is because you're hurting me, it's also hurting you and for it's for your good to set a, a boundary here because um, that's loving as well, right? I think that's another form of love is to, put, to not let yourself be hurt. Yeah, Margie. That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Yeah, well, and that's what, that's why, like, what George was getting at earlier with love is a fruit of the spirit. It's not something that we do on our own. We, you know, it's one thing if in, you know you're talking to people and we say, well, you know, we all need to love each other. Everybody agrees with that, right? Very few people say, actually, no, I think it's better if we all hate each other. We all agree we have to love each other. Then you start drilling down. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to love each other? And then um, even people that say, you know, we don't need religion. We don't need Christianity. We just need to love each other. Well, then you say, what does that look like? And suddenly that bar gets really high because like you said, what Paul is describing here is only perfectly encapsulated in the person of, in, in God through his son, Jesus Christ. I mean, God is love. So God is all these things. We are not. So we all kind of fall short. Um, and sometimes, you know, again, we don't know how to draw those boundaries properly, right? Sometimes we, we're maybe too quick to doubt someone when we should be willing to believe in them. But on the other hand, maybe sometimes we're, you know, we make the mistake of, well, just, oh, well, they'll, they'll fix it this time. And, and where what we really need to do is learn to set those boundaries sometimes. Yeah, right. That's right. Right. That's right. That's right. Very important. Very important. Well, and, and then it changes the sort of relationship. In other words, if you, okay, if you're loving someone and, you know, sometimes you think it's an equal friendship and then it comes to find out that, no, they're, they're just, you know, they're not invested. They're not able to love you. Okay, then you have to say, then you have a choice. You say either this is a ministry friendship where I am ministering to this person and I'm not expecting them to love back in the same way because they're not at the same place spiritually. Or you say, this is not a friendship we can have, right? Sometimes that's necessary to do as well. Um, but it, you know, at least then you're forced to ask the question, what kind of friendship is this? Because um, if you're expecting it to be a reciprocal thing and they can't, for whatever reason, do that, then you have to either say, I can have this as a ministry friendship or no friendship. And you're right, the context of community is important here. Um, how we love the stranger, for example, is going to look different than how we love people within the church community. Um, but we have called to love them both. And how you trust them and how you, that's right. I, I, exactly right. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. He's exhorting the church congregation. And it doesn't say that there's no application and outside of that, but it does, again, it nuances that for us. And that's why our context is so important. Yeah, George, what were you going to say? right yeah we have one yeah <laughs> you're, you're right um, and Greek has depending on how you look at it really about four to five um, and which is really helpful right because um, you know I say I love you to my wife I say I love you to friends I say I love spaghetti so <laughs> yeah and and which is it and, and the answer is well yeah this is where our English isn't so good right G the Greeks had um, um, well, the word agape is, is the word that is in use here, which is that self-serving, sacrificial kind of love. And then if you remember last Sunday morning, we talked about philios, like Greek, the word for um, brotherly love or family love. Um, and then there is eros, which is more the romantic, but probably we'd say the marital love. And then there's storge, which is a different kind of love altogether. But I, and I don't remember what that is. It's a very, it's not very commonly used. I'm not even sure it's found in the New Testament, actually. So um, so anyways, you, you get those nuances, and that, that's where language helps if you can have a, a little, you know, bigger buffet to choose from when it comes to the words that you need to use there. Um, I want to touch a little bit just uh, for, for one, one or two minutes on the last um, paragraph there, because I, I have to tell you, this was something that always kind of threw me. I wasn't always sure what Paul was getting at here. Um, 
And as, as best I can tell, um, and let's go to the last slide too there, um, Matt. Um, yeah, one more. Yeah, I'm sorry, one more. I probably didn't get you to flip it there. Why love is best? Because in the last part, I wasn't always sure what Paul was getting at. Because he says, you know, when I was a child, I talked and spoke like a child and reasoned like a child. Now I'm an adult. And so I, w I wasn't sure how that all fit in. But I think what Paul is getting at here is he's, he's making a comparison between this age that we live in now and the age that is to come. And he's using that by way of, an, he's making that point by way of analogy. He's saying it's like growing up. So he, he's saying, you know, children, they think, reason, and act one way, but they grow up, they reach maturity. And what Paul is saying is we're all like children right now. Until Jesus returns, we will be in this age where we are, you know, we don't see the full picture. We don't see everything that God intends to show us one day. But when Jesus returns, we will see him face to face, and then our knowledge will be complete and then what he's getting at there is in in the final in, in this present age we need faith and we need hope to see that future age right faith is is looking ahead and and trusting that Jesus will return and hope is this picture of of that that you know we know that Jesus will return therefore we live differently because of that today S but but when Jesus returns we won't need faith and hope anymore those things will pass away because our faith will be made sight and our hope will be realized. But what will remain? Well, love. So we love today and we will love in the future. And therefore, Paul says, because love is one of these things that's going to stretch into eternity and faith and mystery and speaking in tongues and prophecy, all of that will no longer have a place in the world that is yet to come. Um, you're, 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 I'll say it a little bit sort of irreverently, but you're betting on the wrong horse, right? Focus on love, Paul says, because that's going to stretch into the rest of time. That will matter still in the world that is to come, whereas speaking in tongues won't anymore. Words of prophecy won't anymore. Knowledge, all of that will all be fully realized. So that's why, that's why he's kind of finishing with that. Any questions on that? That's why Paul says love is really, um, it's a John Coltrane, right? Love supreme. If you're into jazz music, uh, you'll know that. Uh, but that's what Paul is really getting at the end, the supremacy of love. It's greater than everything else because it lasts for eternity. Yeah, Margie. Mm. Mm-hmm, right. Yeah, right, 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 right. That's not such a good idea for you, Moses. Yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 exactly. Yeah, what we see of God now is is so diminished compared to what we will see. It, and it has to be because if we were to see it face to face, it would destroy us. It's that glorious and that radiant. We're not ready, and, and until Jesus returns and perfects us, we won't be ready. But then one day we will. Um, any other thoughts or comments on that? So hopefully as we dissected this, we didn't kill it in the process, right? It hopefully keeps the beauty of it, because it is poetically and lyrically, it's an absolutely beautiful text. Right. The realities of a of a sinful world 
sort of mitigate this, although they, yeah. Yeah, of course. That's right, and and the love will look different in that setting, right? It's not the love that sort of anything goes and do what you want, and of course I'll, you know, if someone is a, that's right, right, that's right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's that's right. And it's, you know, I think it, it's not gushy at all. And I think, um, you know, we, so we always have to be careful not to default to, well, you know, I to, to sort of excuse our way out of the hard difficulty and the challenge of loving other people because love will cost us. You will put yourself out there to help other people and they won't repay it or they won't appreciate it or they will take advantage of it. Um, and in some ways, I, I don't want to say that's good, but that that is part of what love is. Now, there's wisdom that also comes along with that that says, okay, fool me once, you know, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on you, or however. Fool, yeah. George W. Bush made that what much worse one time. So I, if you can Google that and watch that, you'll get a good laugh out of that. But, but um, anyways, you know what my point was, hopefully. Um, but, but, but there is wisdom that does know how to set limits, but the limits are always for their good because it's no one's it's to no one's benefit for them to take advantage of other people and to be manipulative and so a limit is about saying I'm not going to let you take advantage of me because I care about you that you don't do that it's not good for you and it's not good for me and that's that's what a healthy boundary looks like right rather than saying oh, I don't want to love you you that's just too much work or that's going to cost me too much or that's too difficult um, that's the difference I think or one of the differences all right, let's, um, let's pray together and then we'll conclude our service. Father in heaven, you are, um, you are love. Uh, your word tells us that, you, uh, that, that God is love. And when we see you and to the degree that we know you, we know what love really looks like. And you've shown us love in the person of your son, Jesus, who came into this world full of grace and truth. And you lived that life of perfect love. You knew how to pour yourself out for others. You cared for the people that often everybody else ridiculed or um, ostracized or excluded, and you knew how to set limits as well. Um, you did it perfectly. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your love, and we ask that you would teach us more and more each day how to love as you call us to love. Help us to not be looking for ways to advance ourselves at the expense of others or to climb up to the top of the totem pole, but really to serve and to meet the needs of other people around us, even at expense to ourselves. Lord, that's what you've shown us, and that's what you call us to, and thankfully you've given us your spirit to make that um, a reality in our lives, and we pray you continue to do that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's um, stand together, and um, let's sing our song of